Welcome back to Front Runner Podcast. Today we have Julia here. Welcome to our podcast, Julia. Thank you so much. And Julia, there's a, a really interesting topic that I want to talk about with you today. And that, as a foundation, stems off from the era that we're entering into now, which is all about data. So we've got a lot of discussion taking place about data analytics. A lot of companies doing artificial intelligence. It seems that everyone's doing that because everyone's recognizing the value of the data set that we have. But it seems to me that that's only the first start of the process. We have all this data analytics, and now we need to make decisions on it. In some cases, the artificial intelligence, the AI, might be making the decisions. But in other cases, or in conjunction with the AI, we'll have a human. And we have a couple of issues there. How do we present data in a way that people can understand it, as well as how do they understand the data integrity itself? Because if we look at data, we have a couple of issues. We can have incomplete, we can have inaccurate, and we can have algorithms, such as statistical processes that have limitations. And certainly I've seen, and maybe you have as well, is that sometimes the people making decisions don't understand the limitations of how the data is presented, the data itself, or the algorithms used to compute the results. And let me give you a really quick example of that. If we think of two-dimensional charts, if we're trying to represent a complex space of multi-dimensions, a two-dimensional representation means we lose information. Similar to if we take a 256 color image and reduce it to a grayscale, we've lost information. And yet the decision maker looking at those two-dimensional charts might figure that they have all the information they need to make the decision and they're not understanding the limitation of what it is they're saying, seeing. And I'm wondering if you can speak to us in terms of this whole area of understanding the data that the decision maker is working on. And perhaps you could lead us off by talking about the state of the art and the, some of the issues that need to be addressed in the presenting and the consumption of data by decision makers. Sure. I think um, maybe starting off with a with a quote would uh, would be most uh, appropriate. I used to have this quote on um, on my office door uh, when I worked in research, and uh, the quote says, "If you torture the data long enough, it will confess." And <laughs> the reason why I think that that's relevant is this idea of you know over analyzing or you know. The, the, the data is just a representation. It's a it's a it's a small kind of sample or of, of a reality, but it's never the whole picture. And I think that that's the most important limitation to understand right off the bat is that you know you, you're you're taking something that is representative of a reality that that is not reality. Um, and so you know ultimately moving from there, it's really about thinking in terms of bias. Uh, when you have a data set that is representing a reality, but it isn't the reality, what inherent bias does the data possess that, you know, potentially, I'm not saying that all data does, but, but, but that's where the, the kind of the best practice comes into play in thinking about data analytics. Because there's kind of a three-tiered system here in a way, right? There is the, the data acquisition and data sources, and do those, you know, represent the picture? And then moving from the, the data, you know, how do you handle that data? You know, what happens when you don't, when you have missing values or, you know, I don't want to get too granular about the analysis side of this, but it is important to think about the individual or the method that is applied to go from, you know, uh, the whole sample to, you know, the actual working data set. And then from there, if you're answering a specific question with the data, how do you choose the most appropriate you know, analysis to answer the question that you have. So that's kind of we're in tier two now, which is more on the data scientist side. And then going further and deeper, when you're attempting to assemble the, the answer for, you know, the stakeholder or whoever's after the answer to the question, then you have the visualizer or somebody who is going to communicate that 
And so that's where, again, you know, you can take some liberties creatively or, or whatnot, or you can just present raw, you know, results. And I think that that's the push and pull in, you know, something like academia versus more, you know, applying creative direction, um, depending on what uh, is being visualized. And at the end of the day, it's always the audience that needs to drive that, that process, right? That communication process, the movement from the, you know, the results to that final visualization of data and that presentation of data that needs to be driven by the audience that the, that the, those the, the imaging and the visualization is intended for. Julia, you come from an intriguing background in that you've made a combination of art and science and looking at ways in which art, science, data, technology can work together to help knowledge be transmitted and when I listen to what you're describing in terms of data visualization, it makes me wonder whether the old school way of relying on metrics has come to an end. There's one of the issues with metrics that we've seen over the years as to whether they're both valid and reliable. And if they're not valid and reliable, then they're not as necessarily useful, or at least they'll have a an envelope of uncertainty around them. It sounds to me as if Maybe that era of relying on single point metrics, for example, the sales last month was 25 units. We can look at that over time and get a trend. But are we entering into an era in which we're moving away from those simplistic metrics and having a more multidimensional understanding of what it is the data is telling us? How, how is that being done? Um, I think that's really specific to uh, the field. I think that, you know, if we're talking about something that's in academia, you can definitely still be metric reliant because, you know, at the end of the day, if you look at the number of heart attacks in a hospital for the last, you know, five years, looking at those trends, I think is, is still relevant. I think it depends on, on the exact niche. I don't think there's, and maybe this is kind of the, the greater insight from, from the discussion really is that, there's no one kind of ring to rule them all, you know, it, 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 it really is case by case specific. I mean, you know, if you look at, you know, finance and, and, and dashboards and sales, that's a whole different field of, of data visualization versus, you know, the health industry or versus, you know, something like physics. And then, of course, this notion of applying creative direction and going into, you know, more of the data visualization, data art side and thinking about the public. Um, you know, as, as the audience that changes everything because, you know, the public needs to be incentivized to be interested, right? So I think communication with the public is, uh, is different in terms of data than it would be, for instance, with your, you know, uh, you know, with your fundraising team who wants to know if their fundraiser was successful or not based on those metrics. But so it's, it's a, it's a wild west. <laughs> And that, that separation between people who are using the data for deep dive analytics and those who want uh, a simple understanding. If, if I go back to your example of the number of heart attacks in a community, we can look at that and we can measure that over time, but that is, is really an output of a process in, it does, it, it tells us the, perhaps the symptom, but it doesn't tell us the cause for why there may be heart attacks. There's so many factors of why that may be increasing in a community. And therefore, it may tell us the trend, but it doesn't tell us why. And are we seeing in data visualization more of a movement to not just trend data or comparison data or outputs of process kind of metrics, but a deeper understanding of why things are the cause and effect is that more of the movement in the d data understanding visualization area i think the biggest challenge that that i see in in in, in, in at least my practice is really the the gap between having results and having knowledge whether it's an organization or a government and the difficulty of disseminating those to their respective audiences. I think that that is the number one issue that is currently, um, you know, we're working on addressing that in a meaningful way because th there is such a, a gap 
in, you know, now we have our 65 page report or now we have all of these trends, but ultimately, you know, we want to have a meaningful campaign with the results. We want to inform our, you know, audience, our public of the research findings that we have. How do we do that in a way that allows them to understand where we're coming from, but also make decisions based on what, you know, what our findings are and how do we present that in a way that isn't necessarily, you know, biased towards, um, you know, from whatever, you know, samples that it's coming from. So I think that, that that is, I think, a really huge cause for concern is because because one of the things in, in, in visualization that I find is that to connect with the public, you almost kind of have to have this this viral, you know, sense around it, given, the, you know, the social media landscape. People scroll through so much content. How do you capture them? Generally, you have to play on on emotion or they have to be somehow incentivized to, to, to engage. And so when you when you are dealing with that, you know, how do you maintain credibility and, and, and the rigor in the analytics that were performed or in the science or any of that, along with this movement to popularize the findings so that there is interest generated in the first place? I've also tended to find with metrics, there's, as you say, there is that emotional context around it, and we can tell, uh, use metrics to tell a story. But I've often found with metrics that relevancy is a prime consideration that uh, if we go back to the heart attack metric again, if an individual has never experienced a heart attack or doesn't know anyone that's ever experienced one, that may not resonate with them. And therefore, you've suggested that um, some of the issues around metrics are we want to have metrics for deep dive for those that are making decisions. We want to have metrics that capture the essence of the story for those, maybe the general public. But how do we also choose metrics that help with that relevancy issue? And how do we make it so that people pick up on it? There are, as you suggested, there's so many metrics, so many stories, so many issues and cause and, and calls to action. But what I've seen is the calls to action that are relevant to an individual tends to be the ones that are picked up on. So how do we, how do we choose metrics around that relevancy idea? Well, I think an interesting field to kind of explore um, in this case would be data journalism, which is which is an you know emerging kind of field that's been around for a while. But this idea of you know because 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 if we think about who has the most interaction with the public, you know, on the global scale, it's always the the, the media, right? People turn to either Google or they turn to the media for information. And so, you know, having media outlets recognize the importance of data. You know, based reporting and including, um, you know, uh, if you look, if you look at, for instance, the New York Times and, and what Mike Bostock did for for um, you know developing something like that's called D three for interactive visualizations, and you know, if you know had a look at their Upshot articles, um, you know, they're taking database to a whole new level in terms of how they, you know, they allow the user to be a part of the story now. There's a whole interaction piece and where you can make some of your own decisions while you're reading the news, which I think is a a whole new kind of, you know, way of, of, of interacting with the public as a media outlet. Um, and that's more for the public side. But going back to that heart attack example, if all you want to know is, you know, how many units you need to buy or how many beds or whatever it is that you, you need to know as maybe the, the CEO of the hospital, you know, you're, you're already incentivized to look at that data because you, you, you need the information to make decisions and, and you generally know what, you know, decisions um, need to be made so you source that data whereas how do you communicate it's the, it's the public that's the difficulty you know how do you communicate in a meaningful way to the public when they have very specific interests but I do think that there is this this data journalism piece which is important to mention because that's um it's a very interesting field uh, where you combine you know the idea of storytelling with the idea of database storytelling that's very cool yeah, maybe you could give us an example of one of those stories. You're not talking some, something simple about such as people uh, providing comments or liking or disliking or poll results on the. No, no, sure. Story. So, I mean, there's one um, that that um, the New York Times ran. I don't remember the exact name of it, but it had to do with you can decide on whether or not it's better for you to buy a home or rent a home. And so they, they had a little blurb about, you know, the piece. And then what ultimately you were able to do is 
modify some of the parameters based on your own situation and it would actually provide you with some metrics on whether or not in your particular circumstance in your life whether it would actually be better for you to purchase a home or not depending on where you are and so I thought that that was a really interesting way it's almost like a, a tool in a way right that's embedded into a news story and with those results then somehow create a story of their own I mean, the personally, they do to you, right? Because you're you're this individual that's now you know able to participate in 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 making something uh, personal, right? There's this extra step taken that the story um, is not uh, kind of a blanket for everyone to look at. Now you have this extra layer of interacting with it and making that story about you. Very cool. Have to look that up. I, w I want to get back to what you were talking about earlier in terms of the heart attack and the trend analysis. And we can look, we can say a hospital will look at those trends and say, uh, given the trends, we may need these number of beds or, or this kind of services involved. But it, it seems to me that one issue with that is, of course, first order thinking in that if we extrapolate from the past and go into the future, it doesn't always work out that way. If we take data trends and say that that uh, a linear regression model and say we've gone from A to B to C and therefore after C is D and E and we're going to end up in E as you're probably well aware that doesn't necessarily that linear extraction capability or sorry that linear extraction approach doesn't always happen. We might go from A to B to C and then go from F to Z. How do we incorporate that? kind of non-linear thinking into the understanding of the data itself so that we're not making simple extractions or extrapolations of the past into the future. Yeah, I mean, that's that's an interesting topic. In, in the case of, of our hospital, right, I think ultimately what will drive any kind of push for their data analytics would be the strategic vision and mandate and goals that they would like to accomplish. So, you know, if they're in, happy in their circular kind of linear operation, then there's no need for change. But if they are noticing that maybe they want to be somewhere completely different, maybe they want to be at, you know, F or Z or completely somewhere else as, as an organization, then for sure they need to start thinking about, you know, how do we learn from the past, but, but how do we move forward? And maybe that's, you know, I mean, I think that's a difficult thing to kind of, again, generalize about because there's so many different different avenues. Um, one of the fields that I find is, is interesting in terms of kind of, you know, requiring a data set is the idea of machine learning, right? Because you're only going to have, uh, you know, as good of a system as the data that you put into it. So the very, you know, inherent bias right there is the limitation of, of what you're what you're capable of, of putting in as your input. So again, you know, going back to healthcare, if you want to create something that, you know, on the image side, you see a lot of, um, you know, progress being done in image recognition of certain diseases, whether it's ultrasound or x-rays or whatever. And I always think it's, it's, it's a fascinating kind of thing to say, okay, well, you know, here's a huge data set of, you know, a pathological image. Here's a huge data set of, of a, of a healthy one, now we're going to give you a bunch of randoms. How good are you at, you know, as, as, a, as an algorithm at identifying, um, you know, the, 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 the pathological one? And then ultimately, I think, and this is maybe where we're going with all of this, is can we solely rely on that algorithm, given everything we've, you know, air quotes taught it, to really, you know, say, okay, I'm trusting you with my image of my heart or my broken bone or whatever to, to, to determine whether or not, you know, there is an issue. And, and it's that, that human data interface that I think is, 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 the, is such a fascinating, you know, thing to think about. Uh, you, can we ever get into a state where we're just solely reliant on, on, on analytics and, and have nobody interpret them? Sounds like a good point for some takeaways for our listeners, Julia, as we wrap up our podcast. You mentioned an interesting point just at the end there, and I'm wondering whether you have one or two other takeaways for our listeners. Yeah, I think, um, you know, one of the things that, 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 that I noticed just in, you know, in my interactions as a visual communicator is that people often think that they themselves are not capable of being involved or, or, or you know, um, or, or they just don't have the skill set or their they're not um, 
you know, they're not creative or they don't have the understanding. And so they feel that there's this barrier to entry to work with data or work with visualizing data. And, you know, I see that at an organizational level where you have communication teams that are that are struggling. And I think that, um, you know, given uh, the, you know, the, the multiple resources that, that exist online, uh, my biggest takeaway is that, you know, I think people will be surprised at how much they actually can get into the field of visualizing data. Um, and so, you know, science communication and visual communication are these new kind of emerging professions where you exist at the, you know, the, the, the barrier, the kind of the, the, the border of, you know, hard data science and the visualization thereof. So I think that there's a lot to explore there. So my, my, my biggest takeaway is that you probably are not as, you know, you're probably not as limited in creativity and analytics as you as you believe to be. And I highly encourage uh, to seek out resources um, to, to, you know, get, get that education. And there's no barrier to entry in doing so, whether it's looking at Upshot, you know, New York Times articles or Linda courses or YouTube or any of these resources. There's just so much in the data visualization and data analytics profession. I think that um, you know, hearing a dialogue where, where people are saying they're not comfortable with 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 data, I, it, I think that um, yeah, people would be surprised to find out that they in fact are. And then again, the biggest takeaway really is to respect data <laughs> and understand what data is and what data is not, and that data is never representative of a true reality. That sounds like an interesting uh, end point for our conversation here. Julia, I wanted to thank you for talking today about data and understanding, particularly from the visualization, the collection, as well as the analytics side. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, James. I really appreciate the opportunity. Okay.